Fabulous. So hello. Um, welcome to this wonderful lecture session from the horror program at the University of the Underground. I'm Aggie Haynes, head of the horror program, which is a critical exploration into illicit societal fears and human passion for horror. Uh, we're going to be investigating institutions and popular culture through the lens of the horror genre in dramaturgy, film, costume making and more. The University of the Underground is a free, pluralistic and transnational university founded in 2017 and birthed in the basements of night nightlife venues. So we're a non-profit and registered charity. If you'd like to donate, please visit universityoftheunderground.org. And on this website, you can also find other exciting programs times and events. Um, check out the Instagram too for more cool stuff. So I'm really, really excited that we have Heather Albero. Albero? I hope I'm pronouncing that. <laughs> Great. So Heather serves as co-convener for the Political Studies Association Environmental Politics Specialist Group as chair of the PSA's Early Career Network and is an active member of the Utopian Studies Society. Heather also frequently publishes on news platforms such as The Conversation and The Independent. Uh, Heather's PhD thesis involved an eco-critical examination of radical environmental activists, REAs, as a contemporary Ecto ectopian manifestations amid the socio-ecological protuberations of the Anthropocene. So Heather, feel free to take it away when you're ready. Thank you so much uh, for that wonderful introduction. Um, so I'm just going to try to share my screen. Hopefully uh, it works without a hitch. Um, can everybody see my, yeah, yeah. awesome. Okay. Uh, Excellent. Um, yeah, so um, very excited to be here. Um, and thank you so much for everyone who's putting on uh, uh, this amazing program for, for having me today. Um, I'll just be kind of going over what I did a lot of my PhD research on. Um, so radical environmental activists or REAs for short, um, and tying it in a little bit with um, some of the themes, um, the, especially with the horror program. Uh, and so kind of just to give you a little roadmap, I'll um, go over a little bit of the sort of historical context within which these groups have kind of uh, arisen. So the Anthropocene and all of these very uh, kind of uh, kind of scary things that are happening right now with climate change and the sixth mass extinction, as many of you who've been following the COP26 negotiations might, might uh, be very aware of. Um, moving on to just briefly a little bit on the history of, of environmental movements in the North, um, from which then Radical Greens uh, kind of branch off. And then I'll just go a little bit more into what my uh, research centered on, which was their ecological worldview. So what actually motivates these really unique groups of people to do what they do, to risk sometimes even their lives to protect threatened species and, and natural systems. And I'll go a little bit then into some of the tactics they use, uh, which involve uh, the use of blood and other forms of symbolic um, activism to highlight the urgency of the environmental crisis. So you maybe kind of might have already uh, come across this term a few times, sort of been all over the place, the, the mainstream media outlets, The Guardian. Um, it refers to uh, sup the supposedly new geological epoch that we've currently entered, where humans, and I'll kind of go into some of the issues around, you know, designating humans as a whole group. Apologies, I live in the city center, <laughs> it's very loud. Um, and so the you know, basically human society, especially um, since around the uh, 1800s and the start of the industrial revolution, we've been found to exert quite an incredible pressures and impacts on natural systems. And there are a lot of debates around when exactly the Anthropocene began, what it constitutes. Um, for instance, some suggest that it kind of be traced, can be traced back to the discovery and manipulation of fire around one to 1 1.5 million years ago. Others suggest that we started seeing these massive um, impacts um, exerted by humans um, in the Pleistocene megafauna extinction event, basically the mass uh, die off of um, uh, woolly mammoths, saber tooth tigers and other animals that coincided with the arrival of early humans across these continents, uh, Australia, North and South America. Um, so these are some kind of ideas as to, you know, when this notable epoch began. Um, very importantly, uh, a more recent uh, kind of periodization is around 1610. In other words, uh, so the sort of arrival of uh, Columbus and the European colonial powers in North America coincided with such, uh, so essentially uh, 
with the mass uh, destruction, displacement, and, dis and extermination of native populations that occurred, it was so significant that there was actually a dip in CO2 uh, uh, concentrations in the atmosphere that can be traced to around this time in 1610. So that's why many say that, well, you know, the legacies of colonialism and capitalism are in particular, uh, sort of particularly important and significant when we're thinking about contemporary environmental issues like climate change and mass extinctions, uh, because these two systems have had uh, enormous impacts, not only in terms of the violence uh, perpetrated on human populations, not on Western human populations, but also uh, on, um, on the climate and the environment. And so there's a whole kind of field that, that explores the legacies of colonialism and capitalism. Um, a term for this has, has been said not, well, this isn't the Anthropocene because not all humans are equally responsible or, or to blame for what's happening today, but it's really the capitalist scene. So it's the effects of this system, colonialism and capitalism that have to continuously expand and find new markets and new resources and people to exploit, that this is what the problem is. Um, so this is kind of a really important shift within the debates around the Anthropocene because they hone it in a little bit more and they highlight the extreme inequalities that we can see in impacts on the environment. Um, but you know, since 1610, we get around to, especially as I mentioned, the Industrial Revolution. Um, so around, this is sort of one of the main times that, like time periods that, that scientists offer for the start of the Anthropocene and the Capitalocene. Um, so we start to see, you know, incredible increases in global concentrations of CO2 and methane from around 1800, um, relating to the industrial scale burning of fossil fuels. Uh, 1850, this number continues to climb. So you have 285 parts per million, uh, which is already the limit of Holocene variability, because this means that, you know, uh, greenhouse gas con um, emissions concentrations have always fluctuated historically. But around 1850s, when you start to see a radical increase that's beyond that natural background rate, that so it's beyond normal rates of change. And of course, going on to 1900, we see these concentrations continue to increase uh, to what the period that we're now in, uh, which is when we, we the one in which we've seen the most radical changes, it's called the Great Acceleration. So basically, the post-war, post 1950s uh, period, where after the sort of, and these graphs are quite telling because they show you, on the one hand, radical increases in socioeconomic activity, you know, uh, population growth, GDP growth, uh, mass production of goods, and then sort of the uh, on the right there it's shocking how similar the changes are in earth system trends. So alongside all of these changes in sort of the human activity, you see radical increases uh, in uh, methane, carbon dioxide emissions, um, marine fish captures, uh, forest loss or deforestation. Um, so this period since the 1950s um, for many, many scientists is one of the most significant ones because this is when we've seen the most radical alterations and impacts on, on global systems. And just to kind of suggest, uh, go over just a few other examples, it's not just climate change that we're, we're facing right now, uh, which uh, especially after COP, even with uh, the new um, uh, nationally determined contributions by different nation states, the world is still on track to reach uh, around 2.4 degrees uh, warming by 2100, which as the IPCC, the, Interna the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has repeatedly warned that would be absolutely catastrophic. You'd see mass coral reef die-offs, uh, significant sort of uh, increases in um, sea level rise, uh, wildfires, droughts, quite significant changes, um, even more than the ones we're currently experiencing. But it's not just this, we've got plastic pollution. Now, uh, uh, microplastics have been found in babies, in people's bodies, and in, in table salt, in water, in rain, everywhere. And of course, this is a novel phenomenon, so we have yet to really see what the impacts of this will be. Deforestation, especially for commodities like cobalt and palm oil. Palm oil is basically in almost every product you can think of, toothpaste, uh, various kinds of vegan and veggie, vegetarian butters, um, resulting in the loss of a size, the site uh, of a forested area the size of South Africa between 1990 and 2016. And this was also a key area of concern at the climate negotiations in Glasgow uh, this last week. Four of nine planetary boundaries have been crossed, biodiversity loss, deforestation, climate change, disruptions of the nitrogen cycle. Um, so quite a, I mean, think of, these aren't, we would think as usually it's might be sort of a post-apocalyptic or dystopian film uh, content, but this, these horrors are real. These are, these are real, real life dramas. And in relation to the groups that I'm gonna be talking about, 
perhaps one of the most significant issues and something that they are particularly concerned about is the current six mass extinction event. So the quote up there to humans, to non-humans, humans are the devil. That comes from Aldous Huxley's uh, ecotopian novel, Island. Um, and this is kind of, if you think of the perspective from the perspective of non-human animals, um, this is decidedly true. Um, so this is the sixth mass extinction to occur in the Earth's 4.5 billion year history. This one is unique in the sense that it is attributable to the actions of one species or particularly certain sy systems uh, enacted by a species. The combined biomass of humans and livestock now exceeds that of all other vertebrate life apart from fish, which is an absolutely staggering statistic. Uh, there's been a twofold decline in, uh, decline in plant biomass since the start of human civilization. So plants and, and sort of um, other non-animal organisms have been uh, eradicated as well. And the recent World Wildlife Report uh, saw, uh, found it monitors thousands of, mo of different species of birds, mammals, reptiles, fish, and it found that there's been a loss of 68% of monitored populations since, the, since 1970. Um, and this figure has continued to increase every year that they produce this report. Um, so quite severe and considerable cause for concern. Um, and so this, against this backdrop, this is sort of what spurred environmental movements and environmental organizations to sort of come up. So they're trying to, to varying degrees, they're trying to respond to these uh, crises. Um, so kind of, and I'm focusing on, because uh, my research focused on uh, environmentalism in the global north. Um, so the birth of modern environmentalism essentially kind of can be traced to, back to that picture. So the first Earth Day that took place in New York City in 1970. And this was kind of a, the birth of a new environmental awakening. So across the global north, Western Europe, Australia, uh, North America, you saw, and of course, this similar things were happening um, all over the world, but um, a lot of these movements were centered in, in the global north. Um, you saw kind of campaigns for clean water, uh, the safe disposal of, for su of sewage and energy, uh, you know, clean air, improved public health, and various campaigns and organizations set up um, in service of this. And this kind of environmentalism, um, it, crucially, it's, it engages in first order changes from within the present system. So things like promoting recycling, changes in legislation, energy efficient vehicles, reducing meat consumption. So working within the current society to make it greener, to make it more sustainable and, and, uh, and less sort of uh, environmentally destructive. Some common organizations that can be traced to this period and that came up during this time, uh, Greenpeace, for instance, uh, WWF, which I just mentioned, who produced that Living Planet report every year. Um, and so Friends of the Earth, a number of, of similar organizations, and they became sort of institutionalized, which means that they became very large, uh, they had a lot of staff, growth and membership, a lot more resources, and they become much more professionalized and, and structural, and they had structural centralization, so they, they had CEOs, board of directors, they became proper, almost, you know, operating essentially like businesses. Uh, and this then result in shifts in repertoires. So initially Greenpeace, for instance, engaged in more direct action tactics and protests. Um, and they still do to a degree, but um, not quite as much because um, they sort of, because of this professionalization. So they have staff, they have to be careful with legal issues. Um, so they started to engage in more conventional tactics like lobbying, um, as I mentioned, focusing on legislational uh, change um, and operating again within the confines of um, the sort of modern society, which is very important because this is kind of a key point of departure for the other groups that I'll uh, cover in a minute. But so these organizations became more professional, commercialized, and they became what some refer to as reformist. So they, they, didn't, they, started, they didn't really affect very radical changes of society. So they didn't, you know, they, they saw that it was sufficient to green capitalism, make capitalism a little bit more environmentally friendly, again, by passing certain kinds of legislation, doing things like market-based solutions, like uh, carbon taxes and things like that. Um, but they weren't challenging, they weren't making systemic challenges. So um, reform, reform environmentalism then by some critics and, and other activists started to be seen as insufficiently critical of the systemic drivers of environmental breakdown, capitalism, colonialism, um, the, ho the whole, system and paradigm of anthropocentrism, which is the belief in human supremacy. So superior, the belief that humans are superior and separate from nature, and therefore that nature is just a resource for us to use um, to further our own ends. Um, and so this is that, this is the critique that they, only, they were only instrumentally concerned with nature. So this is the argument that 
and you see this a lot in even the debates within the UN um, Environment Program, uh, even with references to COP26, the idea that we need to protect nature and other species to save ourselves, essentially, not because they have any inherent value. And so this was a critique of this kind of environmental uh, movement and these organizations. And so this is then what led to the birth of radical environmental activists around the 1980s. So they kind of splintered off from this, all of these critiques, they were saying, all of these mainstream organizations aren't going far enough. They're not really addressing the root causes of environmental breakdown. So you saw the rise of groups like Animal Liberation Front, um, an offshoot uh, of uh, Earth Liberation Front, um, Earth First, Sea Shepherd, and all of these made these radical, they sought these radical changes within Western capitalist society and how we tend to value nature within Western culture and how we live within Western cultures and societies. The fact that you know, people in the global North have a far greater environmental and carbon footprint than um, any, most people in the developing world. Um, so they were saying that this, there are particular patterns and trends that have to be um, examined and uh, broken down here. And this is kind of then, it ties in with the use of the word radical in radical environmental activism. Now in some circles, uh, especially more mainstream circles, radical can be conflated with like eco-terrorism or terrorism. And that's absolutely not what's going on here. These groups don't ever harm or target living beings. Radical is that they're seeking to address it in the etymological sense of the word roots. So they engage in second order changes which entail the transformation of the system itself. They're trying to challenge capitalism and challenge how we view the world and nature and, um, and trying to go beyond into something like a post-capitalist society that's much more egalitarian and, and uh, with direct democracy. Um, so yeah, and it's in the media as well, and the, that kind of revival of the, of the criminalization of groups like this has been very common recently. Um, but that's, it's, that's a whole debate that, you know, kind of for another time or even maybe in the Q&A session, but um, they definitely are not the way they are, they are portrayed usually in mainstream circles like that. But they have been because of, you know, images like this and some of the acts that they've engaged in. Um, so some of the ones that I did my research on, so these include uh, Earth First, Hambacher Forest, and Sea Shepherd, so all of them pictured here. Hambacher is the sort of uh, top right with the lads in, uh, clad in black. Uh, others there, um, Earth Firsters uh, occupying a mining site in uh, um, somewhere in, in England. It's, they, they never really released the precise location of their, of their actions, but um, the idea with a lot of these direct action tactics is um, so tree spiking as well, they used some of them in the early uh, 80s and 90s when they started sort of doing anti-roads and anti-deforestation uh, campaigns in the, use the states. They would sit, actually sit and live in trees um, for I don't know, days, weeks, months at a time to physically block the trees from being felled and, and cut down. And so these are kind of quite very interventionist tactics. Sea Shepherd in the picture in the bottom, seen physically putting their vessel between uh, whaling vessels that were trying to harpoon a whale. So like actually blocking um, them from doing this and, and, and thereby saving uh, countless animals from being killed. Um, so this is sort of the, the sort of the idea behind all of this is to highlight the urgency of the crisis by taking these extreme uh, measures and also physically actually halting the tides of uh, destruction and halting environmental uh, degradation at their source. Um, and so sometimes they also did you know, destroy property and things like this. So they did quite a few legal things, but nobody was ever harmed in any of these uh, processes. Um, Extinction Rebellion is the most, one of the most recent examples of kind of one of these, these environmental organizations. Um, and they're an interesting one because they're not reformists. They're not quite uh, the same as uh, WWF and, and the other or earlier organizations, but some of the, the radical greens that I've uh, kind of uh, studied have there are a bit of tensions with XR because XR engages mainly uh, in mass civil disobedience. Many of you might have seen uh, getting you know getting arrested, for instance, to call attention to the um, climate and, and biological crisis. They engage in nonviolent direct action, so they're not quite the same. Um, maybe level of a uh, you know in terms of extreme tactics. So there are some tensions with them and. Uh, the other move, groups that I've mentioned. Um, but nevertheless, XR really quite uh, impressive in terms of the use of this sort of carnival tactics, uh, using mass numbers, getting bodies on the street to cause major disruption to highlight um, the urgency of the crisis. And they've been very effective at that. Um, but just, I, I, did, I did interview some of them because some of the XR activists um, 
uh, are former Earth Firsters and, and vice versa. So there is a lot of intersection with the groups, but um, just to kind of mention some of those differences. And so some of the kind of quotes from what they're doing and why, what are these radical environmental activists trying to do? Uh, revolutionaries, as I mentioned, they want to uh, quote unquote, replace the present system of thought with a system that is more caring, more loving, more logical about our role in the natural order of things. Um, believe in the sanctity of life and reverence for earth above all, above all else, justice. Um, and they always talk about the sort of the, they're the burning rage of a dying planet, um, sort of like a defense mechanism, a last minute resort, when clearly, you know, things are only getting worse, you know, emissions continue to rise, species are dying at a faster rate than they ever have before. So clearly, the sort of mainstream measures that we've been engaging in, decades of climate talks have not been um, anywhere near as effective as they should be. So this is sort of the rationale uh, behind what these uh, activists do and why. Um, and so a lot of my researchers have said, okay, picking apart some of these environmental worldviews, like their unique ways of viewing nature and other species, which are very different from a lot of the main kind of mainstream environmental or organizations and activists. So cr crucially, they, as I kind of mentioned, they're kind of, they exhibit post-anthropocentric worldviews. So they challenge notions of human supremacy. Uh, they can, they view nature and other species as inherently valuable. So not just there for our use, but kind of as kin, as, as actual family members that we should respect and protect and exhibit compassion towards. And because of this, they exhibit deep grief over the widespread death and loss of life that they continuously experience in their activism and, and, and more widely in their, in their research and their work. And of course, as I mentioned, they have their, their visions for kind of a new social and political world is uh, they kind of envision decentralized, stable communities, with economic limits. So having societies that are not based on endless expansion and endless growth, kind of reconceiving the good life and, and what it means to, to live a dignified life. So, or other, in other words, stable state economies that involve a re dramatic reduction in material wants as a basis for ecological security and expansion of human well-being. So reconceiving uh, the good life and, and crucially, the good life in relation to other species and how we can live well together in ways that are not very exploitative and, and a bit more ethical. So just an example of these post-anthropocentric worldviews, this is a quote, these are some excerpts that I'll cover from my interviews with them. Um, for some reason, we've separated the world into these three spheres where there's nature, animals, there's us, and it's one of the most arrogant separations in the world. I think we need to reinvent that, the notion of human separateness from nature. We are animals. So they're critiquing that very common, long embedded a uh, hierarchy or train of being within Western culture, especially Western culture where humans are kind of positioned up above at the top. And there's sort of a, a very strict hierarchy in place where everything else that's not a human has been considered in different ways um, as, as separate, as inferior. Uh, many, many ways that we've done this, we, we've always moved the goalpost a bit further saying, okay, well, then maybe it's animals that um, have large brains that can maybe communicate like we do, like whales, but then other things are included. And here he's trying to, is trying to completely break apart this this hierarchy they're saying you know there's no such thing we're not we're never separate from other species we are fun fundamentally interconnected with them they are our family we're animals just like they are and just because we might be different kinds of animals doesn't mean that we are superior and so these are i was also looking into some of their critiques so what are their fundamental issues with the current system current society and what would they like to see different so what are their visions here in the orange is just some quotes of them, of some of the issues that they take, uh, so their critiques. So the belief that some lives are worth more than others, a system that is so absolutely focused on money and power that it's broken any kind of social environmental contract. Um, so it's you know, critiquing a lot of this, the core themes that came about in the interviews were um, these hierarchical anthropocentric values, a lot of references to capitalism as a system that uh, commodifies everything in sight for the pursuit of profit, essentially. Um, and visions of what they want to see, you know, anything that would need to change would be attitudes. So worldviews, the priority would have to be solidarity, empathy, respect, connectedness with people as well as plants as well. Um, again, with these ideas of the need for local communities that are uh, uh, based on a particular bioregion, uh, um, you know, where everything is sustainable, biodegradable, zero carbon footprint, this, this sort of a, a steady state economy kind of idea um, where humans live in ways that don't take from 
the ability from other species to flourish and, and, and live a good life. Motivations, um, so very complex. Again, these, these activists engage in tactics that are rare in terms of activism. They're very um, interventionist, direct action. They're high risk. So not just there's a, there's not just a risk of, of, of arrest, for instance, they can um, from their families sort of being fragmented, but also um, actual death. So like some have actually died in the process of doing what they do. Um, there was one in this Hambacher forest occupation who, after a mass police evacuation of the tree houses that they were living in, fell and and, and died, um, unfortunately. So these are you know they engage in tactics that many of us do not uh, even consider. So what's fascinating is why they do this. So. The worldviews are one part of it. They, they see themselves as so connected and involved in the lives of other species that they they feel compelled to protect them. Um, other things is the, the urgency of the crisis. So this quote from Jellyfish, this is the most important moment. We're, we're up against something that's going to wipe out 8 billion people and it's not going to be the rest of life on the planet. What could be more important than this? Um, seeing the sort of inequality or unjust action, I can't keep quiet. It means risking my freedom or life. So I feel I need to act. So it's a sense of, of injustice that compels them to do whatever has to be done. And injustice, not just against people, but against other species. Um, for me, every individual life that I save or make easy, easier is important enough for me to risk my own life. And uh, so again, it's this, this being um, so implicated in the lives of earth kin that um, a threat to them is, is a, you know, a motivator, a, a reason, a call to action to do just about anything to, to stop it. And so desperate times, desperate measures. So they engage in quite, you know, uh, as I mentioned, uh, road blockades. That's a very common tactic now. They actually will physically um, either glue themselves or tie themselves um, and block a road so lorries and other um, uh, vehicles can't get through with equipment to mining sites, for instance. Civil disobedience, like XR. Um, the direct action tactics, there's another, those are also referred to as ecotage. Um, so the idea being that it's, um, well, number one, to also cause if you destroy property and you do all these things and you destroy a tractor, for instance, you create eventually so much economic uh, damage that it makes these practices even more expensive. And ultimately the idea is that they won't continue if there's so much money being poured into them and they're not being effective. Um, and it's also a political act. So there are tactics that are not, there, a lot of these activists are kind of from, from anarchist tradition. And so they actually see the state itself uh, as an oppressive institution, as an exploitative institution. So they're trying to engage in tactics that the state um, that are beyond the state. So they're not trying to engage. That's why there's, they don't like, they don't they think that it's not enough to just focus on legislation and lobbying and things like this, because they're also very fundamentally critical of the cap modern capitalist state itself. So they're using tactics beyond it to, with which to challenge it. And as I mentioned, the ecotage is targeted against machines that destroy life. So any, so t uh, tractors, anything, any kind of machinery that's used to, uh, you know, chop down a forest, uh, to do anything like this, is fair game, uh, and they have they haven't just set it apart, but they've also uh, engaged in arson. So um, Hambacher as well. There was a couple of years ago now they they kind of set fire to an entire mining operation and shut it down for months. Um, and so the idea being here that it's not um, it's to slow down the processes of, of, of degradation and to inflict economic damage. So make these practices too expensive for them to be viable within kind of again the. Uh, wider capitalist framework where these these things are also done for profit. Um, and other than these kinds of direct interventionist tactics, they also have engaged in a lot of um, some more symbolic activism. Um, so this has been not this is not too common of a tactic, at least it's more common within um, animal rights activists, activist groups, more so than the environmental activist groups that I've mentioned right now. But nevertheless, it's a very fascinating tactic. Um, so the image above there, uh, the more recently um, activists from PETA protesting the Canadian seal slaughter, um, so an enormously expensive uh, practice that costs Canadians taxpayers um, quite, quite a lot of money. And also it is extremely brutal. They, people basically get like hacks and they hack baby seals to death. So kind of the use of blood is in, in many of these situations is uh, it's a shock tactic. It's it's shocking and it's emotionally wrenching, um, and it's a way to highlight the horrors that continue the humans continuously inflict um, on uh, other species and on nature, and not humans. And I get I put them in within quotes because 
it's not everybody <laughs> who's doing this, but in particular, um, systems like capitalism um, and anthropocentrism that it, you know, if, uh, impose this kind of systemic violence on the non-human. Uh, the bottom kind of picture there as well, um, other activist groups protesting um, uh, animal agriculture by going into a McDonald's and just dumping blood everywhere on the floor. <laughs> And the bottom uh, right one is from Sea Shepherd, actually, in one of their campaigns uh, against the Grind Grindertrap. And I always mispronounce that name, but it's uh, a sort of a, a cultural uh, mass slaughter of uh, pilot whales um, in the sort of Danish Faroe Islands. And so you can see there, I think it's mainly sort of a rite of passage type of thing. I think it's mainly men who engage in this, men and boys, but they go out with hacks and they just herd the whales onto the beach and then they, uh, yeah, like just, hack them up to death. Um, so that's the use of this kind of imagery is, is very powerful, it's very moving. And that is sort of similar to the interventionist tactics uh, that are aimed at highlighting sort of the urgency and the horrors of, of environmental and uh, uh, breakdown and, and biological annihilation. This has a similar effect in, in sort of calling attention. It's sort of an extreme uh, image and something that's usually stays um, in the mind and it's not easy to sort of uh, uh, forget. Another kind of interesting uh, example of this, the Red Brigade. Many, some of you might have seen. So these guys, they're a, they're created by the Bristol Street Performance Group, Invisible Circus. Um, so they they often turn up at a lot of Extinction Rebellion protests, and they sort of mime in slow motion and do um, kind of really interesting, again, kind of symbolic and uh, uh, artist sort of artistic sort of uh, 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 protests. So they usually paint their faces in white in order to portray living statues, essentially. Um, and so according to the performers themselves, the Red Brigade is supposed to symbolize, um, hence the use of the color red, uh, the common blood that we share with all species and suggesting that we all sort of are united um, as terrestrial creatures, um, as sharing sort of a, um, having a shared evolutionary history. Um, so another kind of interesting example of the use of the color red, um, but without, you know, doing the sort of dumping of the of red liquid just to more um, obviously symbolize blood. And of course, in the other, just the other, I think PETA and other groups have also used red buckets of paint to throw at people wearing fur coats as another example of the use of uh, the kind of the uh, blood symbolism. But again, it's a very kind of visually sort of arresting color as well. Um, also associated with uh, usually with left uh, organizations and left wing politics, um, which is another kind of uh, thread going on here. And of course, a lot of these groups being politically left. Um, but yeah, so, uh, so it's the kind of going back to that phrase that is often used, um, desperate times, desperate measures. Um, so, you know, we have decades and decades of talks of, of international negotiations and meetings um, and attempts at these reformist tactics, you know, like passing legislation, which have they haven't been useless, um, but clearly there's something sort of else that needs to give because a lot, you know, we've only, we keep going from four to almost five um, planetary systems, um, uh, thresholds that have been crossed, climate change is worsening, and species are drying out at an unprecedented rate, um, so clearly, you know, something, something a bit more uh, radical is needed, and this is sort of the logic that drives a lot of these, um, a lot of these groups, so they've arisen in response to worsening environmental and social crises in the Anthropocene, um, and this is why they kind of engage in these radical repertoires. So in interventionist tactics, uh, dismantling machinery, um, and again, the use of sort of the uh, symbolic tactics to sort of visually uh, highlight some of these issues. Um, and so they, again, the worldviews are kind of a major aspect of what motivates what they do and, and the extent, sort of the extremities that they'll engage in. Um, so they, they see themselves as fundamentally, you know, it connected with, with non-human life and natural systems. Uh, they completely, usually in most cases, completely break apart that, that traditional hierarchy that we see between humans um, and non-humans, especially within Western cultures. So a very long standing tradition of that kind of attitude um, in the West. And so this is also what drives them. So they experience grief when they see and experience or learn of the death of, of these species. So a lot of the Sea Shepherd activists, um, when, when they're referred to, because a lot of them have been um, patrolling the Danish Faroe Islands when the whales are getting slaughtered. And, you know, in some of the interviews with them, they uh, 
very, very emotional. Uh, and they experience quite a lot of uh, grief, ecological grief um, in relation to these, the severing of these kinship bonds with other species, um, with the natural world. That's again, this slow unraveling that we're seeing with the loss of plant and animal species. Um, so this kind of, you know, pushes them to engage in these kinds of tactics uh, to, you know, make these activities not only um, economically non-viable, uh, but actually like this, like putting bodies on the line. They're, they're sort of getting in the way to, to do what they can to protect what's left. And the symbolic tactics are a very curious other example of this, always, you know, nonviolent and kind of playing around with color and artistry and symbolism, um, but highlighting the horrors. So, you know, the, especially with the use of the color red in reference to blood, highlighting the horrors that humans uh, continuously inflict on nature and, and non-human species, um, you know, taking, living them almost with no place left to, to live or to hide, um, you know, and again, this is not just everybody, but especially within uh, Western capitalism and, and things like colonialism, where it's always this continuous expansion, um, the need to expand and commodify. And this is now even extended to, uh, you know, the billionaire space race with people like Elon Musk uh, and, uh, and Jeff Bezos, who are trying to compete, like, essentially, they have explicitly said that they want to colonize other planets terraform Mars and, and the moon and other places to make them fit for human habitation. So again, it's this colonial mindset where other things and places and species are seen as yours, as theirs for the taking. So it's that kind of that next frontier, that next colonial frontier. So these kind of groups and this sort of the kind of, they do remind us that there is hope. Um, they, they do, they are convinced that, you know, the way that we are that we currently live within modern capitalist societies are, is not the only way to live. Um, they kind of themselves live other ways. They live more ethical ways of and egalitarian ways of relating to other species and to nature. Um, and they kind of, a lot of them want like, or try to sort of explore these alternatives and, and always highlight that there is, you know, other worlds are possible. We're running out of time, but it, you know, the future is never certain, it's never written. Uh, so things can change with concerted and uh, widespread efforts. Um, but I think I'll, yeah, I'll leave it there and maybe just open up the kind of floor if anybody has any questions or anything like that. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for listening. Um. Heather, thank you. Thank you. That was wonderful. Um, so does anyone have any questions for Heather? Emily? Hey, I got a question. Thank you so much. Um, you know, you were talking about like the environmental awakening in the 70s with the first official Earth Day. I was just wondering, because I thought about the Great Frog in London in the 50s, if there was, is there any like historical evidence that people have been kind of climate activists prior to like the 60s and 70s? Yeah, thank you so much for that. Um, yeah, absolutely. So we've had um, a number of, of, of cases of, of environmental cataclysms like the Great Fog um, uh, way before uh, sort of the, the that post-1945 Great Acceleration era where you, you have a, a radical increase in like issues becoming more visible with, with uh, you know, the ozone depletion, with fog, uh, with acid rain, for instance. Um, so there's definitely, there definitely quite a lot of um, you know, human awareness of these things has a very long history. But what's curious about, like, so the 1970 marker is interesting because that's just when you see an explosion of a mobilization. So people going out in the streets, uh, the birth of all of these environmental organizations, the birth of the um, uh, Environmental Protection Agency uh, in, in the States, for instance, like mass passing of legislation, uh, clean, uh, you know, for air, clean air, water, all happening around this time, which is quite curious. Uh, but I think also, like, so the publication of uh, Rachel Car uh, Carson's uh, Silent Spring, but right before that. So that's a really good example of a, a landmark work that kind of spearheaded um, the environmental movement. So I think her it was published in 1962. And you have the novels, so in the literary world, uh, in ecotopian novels, like, so I mentioned Aldous Huxley's uh, Island. You also have a lot of examples of landmark literary works that were picking up these issues before this as well. So just a little bit uh, in the 60s. Um, so I think, yeah, it's, it's curious that for some reason, from, you know, all of these sort of things coalesced around that 1970 marker and then have just picked up ever since because now we have you know the youth climate movements and everything and it's all kind of coming to a head but but yeah absolutely that's just 
um, it's, I guess, notable in the literature because there was so much happening around that time uh, at the same time. Catherine. Uh, yeah, my names keep changing when I change it. <laughs> That's fine. And uh, thank you. That was really interesting. I just wanted to ask you, I, you mentioned during the kind of beginning introducing the like the worldview of kind of environmental protest and multi-speciesism that about um, the good life and this idea of kind of like changing how we perceive what that means. Just because I my work's been informed before by a lot of disability theory and there's lots of similarities in that as well. And just how important do you think that is in this kind of global environmental movement, this idea of kind of changing what it means to live a good life? Yeah, thank you so much for that, Catherine. Um, yeah, so because a lot of um, a lot of my current work, um, so I I don't at the moment I don't re I haven't I've kind of shifted my focus away from environmental movements and I I do a lot of lecturing and and research and sustainable development and, and things like that, and post development and a lot, uh, that's I mean development itself is is about how we define you know what what a dignified and a good life is and in mainstream again in mainstream circles especially since the nineteen eighties and you know the whole idea of development. And sustainable development has been a Western concept. It's been organized around, uh, you know, capitalist systems and 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 Western anthropocentric systems. So it's based on, uh, it's they only just recently incorporated nature and other species into it. And even then, in, in sustainable development debates, it's all about well, how can we, you know, rein in capitalism and, and and endless growth in a way that it won't destroy our foundations of existence. But it's not. It's never about other species. So how we think of the good life within uh, modern capitalism is, 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 again, it's about endless material consumption, it's about growth. It's a qualitative a quantitative definition, not about, okay, how, how can we live in ways that are ethical, that are inclusive, that embed respect and compassion um, for others firmly within, within our definitions of how society should be organized. So within, there's a kind of whole field after that called post-development um, that looks at like uh, basically non-Western definitions of this, the good life, uh, buen vivir, uh, a number of indigenous sort of definitions of this, which all say, uh, define the good life in radically different ways. Um, Non-hierarchical, much more inclusive. It's based on living well in community with others rather than this notion of, you know, of expansion and, and material uh, 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 sort of consumption. So I think, and a lot of so in the conservation field, so a lot of scientists were concerned with biodiversity decline. They've made this much more central recently. And I've been working with some of them who are, who are saying, well, if you know, addressing biodiversity decline and climate change, you cannot do that without addressing attitudes and worldviews, uh, because that orients that that basically structures how we we orient ourselves in the world, how we treat others. Um, if you have an exploitative colonial mindset that paints everything out there that's uh, as yours for the taking. That's, a, as we've seen, that that has a massive impact on policy, on how our socioeconomic systems are designed. So personally, I think their attitudes are fundamental. Um, and unless we transition to sort of examples of this post-anthropocentric uh, attitude to nature where they are our family, their kin, something that indigenous cultures for, for thousands of years have exhibited, um, we will not have sort of a <laughs> chance, really. Um, so yeah, thank you for that. It's a really, really good point. <laughs> Hi, thank you for the great lecture. I was wondering uh, what you think, or if you notice any like generational changes now with the younger generations, but you think or like this, um, yeah, how these uh, post-anthropocentric or breaking that um, uh, human supremacy, um, how that, if, if it's being implemented in younger generations, if you see that shift, yeah, just curious about that. Yeah, thank you so much for that, Leila. Um, yeah, so I mean, the incredible kind of outpouring of youth environmental activism in the, the last few years has been incredibly inspiring with the Fridays for Future movement, Greta Thunberg and, and a number of others coming forward and kind of basically, I mean, leading sort of the way in all of these things. And they had a huge presence obviously at COP26. Um, so I think there is, I mean, there's interesting generation. I mean, and if you look at the framing of a lot of youth activists, you know, there's like, you, why go to school? Because you've, you've plundered our future, you've squandered our futures. Um, is a lot of it is this framing of a theft of of the future of a dis uh, disregarding 
the well-being of future generations, um, and again, humans and non-humans in, in this case. Um, curiously, from my, so I, I haven't done research with youth activists. I have a lot of colleagues who do, who are, who are specializing in youth environmental activism. Um, but in my kind of research sample, I interviewed like 26 um, activists from different radical green groups. Um, and I would say there's probably a 50-50 split in terms of age or generational stuff. So like quite a few of them were under um, under 25, but a lot of them, some of the most committed and the most passionate ones uh, had had were in their 60s and, and 70s who had been around in the original Twyford Down anti-roads protest movements in, in the UK and, and things like this. Um, so so yeah, it's um I think from the perspective of youth activists, there seems to be sort of this disillusionment that they have been forgotten and left behind and that. Um, so again, it's when you look at some of the debates around sustainable development, it's about development that meets the needs of the present without, uh, you know, uh, without compromising the needs of future generations. And that kind of pact has been broken. Um, so I think there's been a definite change there, and that's why the youth are so pissed, <laughs> and they have every right to be. Um, but I personally would be interested in seeing to what degree uh, emphases on the non-human factor in some of their mobilizations. And this is actually a question that I've asked some of my colleagues and that we have yet to discuss. But certainly, I mean, they're, uh, they're um, sort of a, at the forefront of a lot of these movements. So that, that's something that's, that's quite important there. Yeah. Thank you. Probably got time for like maybe one or two more questions, if anyone's got one. Yeah, I well, thank you for for, for that it was amazing, and and also we we got a, a paper uh, that we could uh, read. Um, it was the, in the shadow of death, and um, in in that article you you end it with this idea of this intersection of dread and hope that I found very interesting because it does like this idea of like. Uh, kind of uh, uh, the possibility that looking into the darkness uh, and to the darkest options of a future of the not yet can open up in the present. And I was wondering, um, yeah, I was wondering like if you could expand a little bit on that and how can that be possibly a, a tool uh, to, to, to fight um, maybe a certain kind of idea of development as you were saying. So if like if that's a, a point, like trying to see darkness to, to you know, to quit all this bright um, growth idea that we're going to and how. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Ludovic, uh, sorry, I don't know how to pronounce your name. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's um, that's in reference to, so a lot of the work I do within um, utopian and dystopian studies, um, and that's where I was framing these activists as sort of ecotopian, examples of e modern ecotopianism in, in the form of environmental movements, because uh, they're kind of affecting radical critiques of the current system. They're saying it's, it's totally deficient, it's not enough, uh, it's, it is very, very dystopian, essentially, in the context we're living in, especially for other species. And yet they don't, so they 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 engage in, they, they despair a lot, and they talk about a sort of a loss of hope, but what they're critiquing is hope in the sense of uh, projecting with certainty that something is going to come in the future. So the kind of hope that they engage in is um, with this possibility that, you know, and they always repeatedly say another world is possible. That's a very kind of profound statement. That's the statement that's being used by a lot of movements and in literary works as well, that a better world is not guaranteed, but it can be brought about by these radical changes that they want to bring about. Um, and within dystopianism, uh, which is kind of the sister, kind of the other coin of the, of the sort of field of utopianism, it's all about highlighting and showing sort of the, the the dark present and showing how much worse things could be projecting nightmarish futures to sort of shock people and kind of uh you know through this since that's created to, to shock people into to you know fundamentally changing their ways and, and and saying that you know we need radical changes or this is what awaits us so all the projections from the ipcc saying that if we reach two degrees we pass two degrees warming three uh, I mean, hell and high water. And, and we've already seen a glimpse of this with the wildfires that destroyed so many parts of Australia that killed over uh, nearly a billion animals. Um, this is what's already here. This is what's coming. And engaging with this and, you know, 
embracing that and seeing the loss and using that um, like the activists do as a motivator for, for fundamental change and, and radical action is, is as they demonstrated, is something that can be very powerful um, and, and it can sort of um, spur that kind of change that's needed. Um, so and that's, again, that kind of hope, maintaining hope in a better future, um, but in that way that, it, that it's engaged with the possibility of, of the not yet because you know, as I mentioned, it's it's never written. There, you know, we, there are infinite numbers of pathways we have in front of us. They can be even more dystopian than we have now, or they can be a lot better. Not perfect, you know, th that doesn't exist. Purity and perfection are not attainable. Um, but things can be a lot less bad um, if you if you engage in these things. So I think that was the idea behind that, and I just, that's what a lot of the activists themselves always kind of say and reiterate in the uh, in the interviews. Well, Heather, thank you so, so much for joining us and for your wonderful talk. Thank you. Um, I, I believe that you're joining us for a panel discussion from five till six, I think. Yeah, fabulous. So uh, if any more questions ferment in anyone's minds, we, we can chat more on, on this topic later. But Heather, thank you so much for your time. Look forward to seeing you uh, in about an hour. Thanks everybody for listening and Yay. see you in a bit. <laughs> Thank you.